one of my habits is to go on jags, and uh, in the last day I've had this, uh, I've gone on this jag of finding essays I like, um, and taking excerpts and uh, reading them to you. I've done a couple, one by George Orwell, another uh, by Isaiah Berlin, uh, you'll see them in my YouTubes, and this one, um, I like, I tend to like essays that are contrarian, that don't, don't say the same old crap that we tend to hear all the time. And this one is a particularly good example of it. It's called Against Joie de Vivre, Against the Love of Life, uh, written by Philip Lapate, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, big deal guy. Uh, and I love the essay for what it's worth in here. It's, these are excerpts. It's not the, the whole thing is really, really long. This is just a, a, some snippets. Over the years, I've developed a distaste for the spectacle of joie de vivre, love of life, the knack of knowing how to live. Not that I disapprove of all hearty enjoyment of life. What rankles me is the stylization of this private condition into a bullying social ritual, a warning. Since I myself have a large store of nervous discontent, some would say hostility, I am apt to be harsh in my secret judgment of others, seeing them as defective because they are not enough like me. But the knowledge that my discriminations are skewed and not always universally desirable doesn't stop me in the least from making them, just as one never gives up a negative first impression, no matter how many times it's contradicted. A believer in astrology, having guessed that someone is a Sagittarius and then told he's a Scorpio, says, oh, Scorpio, yes, of course without missing a beat, or without relinquishing confidence in his ability to tell people signs, or relinquishing confidence in his idea that a person is somehow secretly Sagittarian. I remember the exact year when my dislike for joie de vivre began to crystallize. It was 1969. We had gone to visit an old Greek painter on his houseboat in Sausalito. Old Vartus's vitality was legendary, and it was considered a spiritual honor to meet him, like getting an audience with the Pope. Each Sunday, he had a sort of open house, or open boat. As he took us into the houseboat cabin, he told me proudly that he was 77 years old and gestured toward the paintings that were spaced a few feet apart, leaning on the floor against the wall. They were celebrations of the blue Aegean, boats moored in ports, whitewashed houses on a hill, painted in primary colors and decorated with collage materials, mirrors, burlap, lifesaver, candies. These sunny little canvases, with their talented innocence, third-generation spirit of Montmartre, bore testimony to a love of life so unbending, so as to leave an impression of rigid narrow-mindedness as extreme as any Savonarola. Their rejection of sorrow was total. They were the sort of festive paintings that sell in high-rent Madison Avenue galleries specializing in European schlock. Then I became aware of three young, beautiful women, bare shoulders, wearing white, each with long blonde hair falling onto a sky-blue halter, unmistakably suggesting the three graces. They lived with him on the houseboat, I was told, giving no one knew what compensation for their lodgings. Then the boat, equipped with a sail, was launched to sea. I must admit it gave me a spoil sports pleasure when the winds turned calm. We could not move. Aboard were several members of the Bay Area's French colony who dangled their feet over the sides, passed about bunches of grapes, and sang what I imagine were Gaelic camping songs. In the evening, after a communal dinner, the new Grateful Dead record Frank had brought was put on the phonograph, and Vardas danced, first by himself, then with all three graces, bending his arms in broad, hooking sweeps. He stomped his foot and looked around scampishly at the guest for appreciation, not unlike a monkey grinder and his monkey. Imagine, if you will, a being whose generous bestowal of self-satisfaction invites and is willing to receive nothing but flattery in return, a person who has managed to make others buy his somewhat senile projection of indestructibility as a hymn to life. The whole movie I've run off in my head about all of this has the title the man who gave Joie de Vivre a bad name. Turning to dinner parties. I'm invited periodically to dinner parties and brunches, and I go, because I like to be with people and oblige them, even if I secretly cannot share their optimism about, the, optimism about these events. 
I go not believing I'll have fun, but with the intent of observing people who think a dinner party is a good time. I eat their fancy food, drink the wine, make my share of entertaining conversation, and often leave having had a pleasant evening, which does not prevent me from anticipating the next invitation with the same bleak lack of hope. To put it in a nutshell, I'm an ingrate. I don't expect the reader to agree with me. That's not the point. Unlike the behavior called for in a dinner party, I am not obliged, sitting at my computer, to help procure consensus every moment. So I'm at liberty to declare to the friend who once told me that dinner parties were one of the only opportunities for intelligently convivial conversation to take place in this cold, fragmented city, that that person is crazy. The conversation at dinner parties is of a mind-numbing caliber. No discussion of any clarifying rigor, be political, spiritual, artistic, or financial, can take place in a context where fervent conviction of any kind is frowned upon, and the desire to follow through sequence of idea must give way every time to the impressionistic breezy flitting from topic to topic. Talk must be bubbly, but not penetrating. Illumination would only slow the flow. Some hit-and-run remark may accidentally jog an idea loose, but in such cases it's better to scribble a few words on down in a napkin for later than attempt to think at a dinner party. What do people talk about at such gatherings? The latest movies, the priciness of things, word processors, restaurants, muggings and burglaries, private versus public schools, that fool in the White House, there have been so many fools now that that subject is getting tired, the undeserved reputation of certain better known professionals in one field, the fashions in investments, the investments in fashion. What is traded at the dinner party table is, of course, class information. You will learn whether you are in the avant-garde or rear-guard of your social class, or preferably right in step. The first to leave a dinner party breaks the communal spell. There is a sudden rush to the coat closet, the bathroom, the bedroom, as others, under the protection of the first defector's original sin, quit the party apologetically. The utopian dream has collapsed. Left behind are a few loyalists and insomniacs, swillers of a last cognac. Don't leave yet, begs the host, knowing what a sense of letdown, pain, and self-recrimination awaits. Dirty dishes are, if anything, a comfort. The faucet's warm gush serves to save off the moment of anesthetized stock-taking. Was that really necessary? In the sobering silence which follows a dinner party. Next, let's talk about the beach. The prospect of a long day at the beach makes me panic. There is no harder work I can think of than taking myself off somewhere pleasant where I am forced to stay for hours and, quote, have fun. Taking it easy, watching my personality's borders loosen and dissolve, arouses an unpleasantly floating giddiness. I don't even like waterbeds. The other repugnance I experience around joie de vivism is they associate its ritual with depression. All those people sitting around a pool drinking margaritas, they're not really happy, they're depressed. Maybe I'm generalizing too much for my own despair in such situations. Drunk, sunbaked, stretched out in a beach chair, I am unable to ward off the sensation of being utterly alone, unconnected. Keep busy, I always say. At all costs, avoid the trough of passivity, which leads to the slough of despond. I stay away from depressed characters whenever possible, except when they happen to be my closest friends or family members. It goes without saying that I am also, for all my squeamishness, attracted to depressed people, since they seem to know something I don't. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that the brown-gray logic of depression is the truth. In an experiment reported in Time's science section, pitting optimists against clinically diagnosed depressives on their self-perceived abilities to affect outcomes according to their wills, researchers concluded that depressed people may have a more realistic, clear-sighted view of the world. The argument of both the hedonist and the guru is that if we were but to open ourselves to the richness of the moment, to concentrate on the feast before us, we would be filled with bliss. I have lived in the present from time to time, and I can tell you it's much overrated. Occasionally, as a holiday from stroking one's memory or brooding about one's future worries, I grant you it could be a nice change of pace. But to be here now, hour after hour, would never work. I don't even approve of stories written in the present tense. If I attend a conference, obviously not to listen to the music, but to find a brief breathing space on which to meditate on the past and future, I realize there may be moments where the music invades my ears and I'm forced to pay attention to it note after note. I believe I take such intrusions gracefully. The present is not always an unwelcome guest, so long as it doesn't stay too long and cut into our time for remembering. 
Are there people who live under such spells all the time? Was this the secret of the idiotic smile on the half-moon face of the painter Vartus? The lovers of life, the robust, robust Cellinis, the Casanovas? Is there a technique to hedonism that will allow the term of rapture to be indefinitely extended? I don't believe it. Joie de vivre? It's too compensatory. In any event, I thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. I welcome your thumbs up and accept your down, thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. Almost all of my um, YouTubes are practical how-to advice, occasionally punctuated by some me playing the piano and these, these, uh, these essays. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.